uh, down in Caledonia, right? All of these networks included people who are not vegan, not animal rights activists, would never be at a demonstration on marine land, but were all people who knew that, you know, when the time came, we stuck up for them and we did what we could, and when the time comes for us, they're going to come on board and they're going to help us. So out of that, the very next, the weekend after those stories break, we organize a demonstration that's 500 people. 500 people, that was a record at Marineland ever, and it was, as far as I know, probably the second largest, the third largest animal advocacy demonstration in Canadian history. Only possible because we have people who can hook us up with buses, who can hook us up with uh, PA systems, who can basically tell us and help us with our press strategy and our media strategy, and all of these people are not people you know, who were core organizers before that. That demo is done, we continue on through the summer, and it's a similar situation. Throughout, we're just pulling on that network for more people to come in, more friends and people who are organizing in different struggles. And also, those people are doing a lot of legwork for getting the word out outside of our own little world, right? So you have organizers for you know, refugee and, and migrant advocacy works, you know, people who are just constantly on this issue, sharing all these stories through their networks. A whole different base. One of the biggest problems with organizing in kind of the social media age is that you basically, you create this kind of bubble. It's called cyber balkanization, so especially in radical circles, we're basically only talking to each other. So although the bubble may grow incrementally, we're not actually reaching outside of it. All the people who are, you know, the public, the community, the people who are actually going to create change on this issue, or, you know, the mass that we need, we're not actually messaging to them. So. Coalition organizing is fundamentally important, especially in the age of social media, because that's how you're going to drive and get outside of those kind of bubbles. Those folks are helping out, and then we lead up, basically, for folks who are organizing, especially campaigns, pressure campaigns, one of the hardest things is always having something after. So, if you have one demonstration that's going to be really big, what are you going to do after that? So we set at that first demonstration, a closing day demonstration, and uh, we managed to get Rick O'Berry to confirm to come down. Does anyone, everyone know who Rick O'Berry is in the room? Uh, Rick O'Berry is a famed dolphin trainer uh, who basically, you know, switches on the industry. So he was a trainer for Flipper in the 50s, and uh, he was considered one of the world's foremost dolphin trainers. Flipper actually dies in his arm arms, and within 24 hours, he just completely does a 180 on the industry and starts going out trying to cut locks <laughs> like sea pens. Wow. Yeah, so and he's done this now consistently for over 40 years. So we set that demonstration and we had everyone and all the momentum, momentum building to that demonstration. October 8th, 7th, sorry, comes. It's Sunday and 800 people come out. At least that's what the Niagara Regional Police called it. They may have inflated our numbers a bit, but it was around 700 to 800 people came out second largest animal advocacy demonstration in Canadian history, and now the largest ever in Marineland. It was funny because we had, at that demonstration, you know, again, we, we pulled on that network to bring people out and to really set it up, but we really changed our focus and we set a very structured demonstration schedule where we had, you know, this speaker at this time, this speaker at this time, this person performing, this person performing, and, um, the opposite to that, people were very mindful of that and very respectful, but there, there was this carnival atmosphere where you get that many people in one place, right? People just aren't going to respect a speaking schedule. So as the talks are going on, people are moving up further and further and further to the front gates. And because of what had happened in 2011 with really heavy police presence, the cops, when we have our larger demonstrations, they only send one or two cops. This demonstration, they had two cops for 800 people. Previously, we've had like four for three people leafing, but this this particular demonstration, they brought two cops. And as you know, the singing is going on, and people are talking, people are inching forward and forward and forward. And finally, it comes to the point where <laughs> I'm actually setting up the PA for this is sing along. I thought this was like the cheesiest idea ever. I'm sorry, Megan and people who constructed this, but like. It was just like, you know, overly emotional. It was a song called Call of the Wild. And then we had like lyric sheets, millions of them. And I just could not understand why we were going to sing Call of the Wild. But everyone was into it, so I was going to humor it. I'm setting the PA up for that, for Call of the Wild. And it's like serious. 
And then I got people like tapping me on the shoulder, like, Dylan, people are inside the park right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> and it was like this, you know, like devil and angel on my shoulder. It's like, call the wild, people in the park. Call the wild. <laughs> um, but I realized that I felt like I had a responsibility, right, to the people inside the park. I'm one of the organizers of the event. Um, I was a marshal for that event. I was a police liaison. And I didn't want a bunch of people getting busted up in a park, basically. So I head over, I make sure everyone's kind of filming, and I see everyone's hopping the turnstiles and heading into the park. Everyone's chanting, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. It's really powerful. Um, for people who want to see video of that, there's probably at least like five different perspectives for people who are actually there that are, that are on YouTube. So just look for Marine Land, October 7, 2012. <clears throat> but we get into the park. And uh, they actually shut down the last Dolphin show of the year. Um, they stop the show, the crowd leaves from the auditorium, and then basically the activists all stay. About like 25 more cop cars came <laughs> um, very fast. And they hit the inside of the, of the park very quickly and basically gave the trespass request. So in Canada, I don't know how trespass laws work in uh, the state of New York, but in Canada, basically an occupant or a representative has to make a trespass request and then you have to be allowed the ability to retreat, right? So because there was only two cops and so many people, they didn't actually make the trespass request. So like you got like 30 cops going in at the same time. Get out of here right now or you're going to hit. <laughs> it's going to be trespass. So people break up and one crowd goes to one side of the auditorium and the other crowd kind of comes back. And this became like a really scary point for me because they split that crowd and the people who were split in the second section were over on the other side of the auditorium. So no one could see them at all. And it was like, are they getting kettled? Like, are these going to be the people who are going to go down on this? Like, what's going on? So it's like two minutes, I got a cop screaming in my face. You get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. I'm like, no, I'm just gonna, I have to wait, I have to wait until I see that everyone else has come around. And then finally you hear people chanting, they actually led like a mini, mini march around. <laughs> And back out, but we go back out, and uh, this is a, a really good story, especially for coalition organizing. A good friend of mine, Zach, predominantly he does anti nuclear organizing. Um, if people know actually the history of the animal liberation movement, there's a lot of rich history for anti nuclear organizing that ties into animal liberation organizing, especially Earth Liberation Front and things like that. Um, what's going on? But Zach comes down, and he's basically like our, uh, you know, our campaign videographer at that time. And Zach's whole thing is like, take whatever is like hot at that time, make a video out of it, and try to make it go viral. So he shows up off the bus that day, and everything's gang style. It's like October 7th. So he's got like this little whale hat on. And he's going up to everyone, he's like, you're going to do gang style today. You're going to do gang style today. And it's like, but I want to sing Call the Wild. Like, no, you're going to do gang style. Uh, we got lucky in that one of the actual ex performers in the Dolphin Show, his name was Spandy Andy. Uh, he actually comes to the October 7th demonstration and gives a really, it was a, actually a really good speech about how, um, you know, he's a consenting human performer and that his experiences at Marineland, you know, illustrated to him that, you know, that's how it should stay. That the animals there don't actually consent to being, per to performing, they're actually abused so that they will. They're starved and, you know, they are abused so that they will perform. So, we come out, Everyone's piling basically out of the park this time, and I, I can't really find words to explain it. It was a, it was a carnival atmosphere. Everyone's like grinning ear to ear, slapping each other on the back. Everyone's like, I can't believe we didn't get arrested. This is awesome. This is amazing. And we head out basically to this huge circle that's created. And Spandy Andy like sets his boombox down, and Zach's got like this whole thing set up where like Spandy Andy starts doing gang nice. style right in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. And those videos actually, you know. To, to Zach's credit, they actually did go viral, but it was just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> the demonstration ends, and uh, that was basically it for the end of the season. So we kind of pack up, and um, you know, we go home, and it's again, like, what's the next thing? So we set the next demonstration. May 18th is opening day at Marineland. Uh, Rick O'Berry is going to be coming back. Uh, a focus for us this year is uh, we've got a young little activist, he's probably about seven or eight years old, his name is VJ, and he like, he constantly will fold a thousand origamis as his wish to free the animals from Greenland. People know that story, uh, it's Japanese basically folklore, if you fold a thousand origamis you'll be granted one wish, so 
For that demonstration, we're going to try and spin it in that way. We want everyone to bring an origami, and we're going to kind of honor the children and, and uh, VJ for that one. But it also becomes this really scary time because this event has happened, and we had so much success over the summer, and we know that there's going to be a response. You just fundamentally you know it. We knew in 2011, if we were ever successful in the organizing we were doing, and we ever did what we wanted to do, we'd be sued. Like that's, we prepared for that from the get-go, and we just accepted that as something that was going to happen. So, funny enough, uh, I get that call. It was in December. I was up in Ottawa. People in the room know I don't know more. Yeah. Yeah. So I was up in Ottawa on December 21st. There was a big rally up in Ottawa, and uh, I had made the decision that I was going to go. Uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning the night previously, and uh, I did not prepare myself. I'm, I'm like, for people who demonstrate here, I'm like the guy who shows up to like the fur demo, like no gloves, t-shirt, <laughs> middle of winter. Um, so we go up to Ottawa, and it's slushy, it's just disgusting, and I start to feel really, really sick. I'm like, oh man, I can't believe this, I'm so stupid, why did I not prepare? And I go and uh, I duck in once we finally march up to the parliament. I duck in at one of the little coffee shops, and I get a call, and it's a uh, it's a Niagara Falls Review reporter. And for people, this would be kind of tough uh, for people on this side of the border to see, but in well, I guess probably not in Canada, the Quebecer Media Corporation (QMI). Okay, they own Sun Media. Sun Media is basically just a complete kind of like. Um, it's the Canadian version of CNN, basically. So it's uh, corporate right-wing media. That's their spin. Um, they're intentionally inflammatory. They intentionally get things wrong because they're basically trying to bait. That's their form of journalism. So they know, like, don't call Dylan. Like, if you call Dylan, either he'll never call you back or you're going to get chewed out and told how to be a journalist. <laughs> so it's like, if you were going to call Dylan, it better be something very, like, important. Uh, he calls me, and I'm sitting down, and... Uh, so you gotta call me back. So I call him back. Oh yeah, I wonder if uh, I can get a comment. Uh, you're being sued for 1.5 million dollars, and uh, they're asking for a multiple location injunction. Uh, at that time, I was like, "What are you doing, calling me? Don't call me about this stuff." Um, so I hang up the phone. But for people who need a background, slap suits—they're considered the exact same terminology in uh, you know in Western New York. But it's a strategic lawsuit against public participation. So basically what you're, you have is a large corporate entity or one player who has a lot of resources basically trying to leverage the legal system to silence individual voices or public concern that you know, don't have those resources. So they throw huge figures on like $1.5 million, right? Attempting to basically scare you into thinking like, will I lose my home? What about my credit? Will I go bankrupt? You know, how am I going to fight this? What are we going to do for lawyers? Because we were prepared for this, we were able to neutralize this in a way that's kind of, you know, least amount of resources possible and least amount of effort as possible. Because what they're also trying to do is basically take the focus away from the park and make the focus the lawsuit. Um, and they also want to chill all the other organizers. So, in myself, I organized my life in a way where I put myself out front and I made myself a target because I don't have to worry about employers, you know, looking at what's what is said about Dylan Powell on the internet, right? Uh, is he a cult leader? Is he a terrorist? Is he a criminal? Uh, what's like the latest one? I don't even know. I can't I can't follow it anymore. But the con artist. Um, but other people, you know, have government jobs or are professionals or have families, have homes, have mortgages, all these things, you know, where they, they genuinely feel afraid, right? So what they're attempting to do is through me message to those people as well. If you're going to keep speaking out on this issue, you know, Morgan Dunbar, I'll go after you. I'll sue you. And we'll go after the next person and the next person. The beautiful thing, though, about slap suits, if you know that they're coming, is that you can already organize against them. And you can use them to your advantage. So the actual timing for Marine Land slap suit was uh, December 20th. The Toronto Star finally ran a story on the mass graves. So if people remember, that's a conversation in June 2011, yeah. wow. in December 20th, finally the mass grave story ran. And how that basically happened was the Toronto Star called the Ministry of the Environment in, in Ontario and said, oh, so Rinland has these uh, mass graves uh, for animals. Uh, do they need a permit for that? And the Ministry of the Environment went, yeah. Well, do they have a permit for that? No. <laughs> so 
like, oh, interesting. So the Registry of the Environment actually initiates an investigation at that point into the four mass graves of Greenland. So there's four pits. Uh, the biggest pit has over a thousand animals, and this is basically just a collection of animals over the 50 years span of the park. Uh, it actually would be a lot more because up until um, they actually get membership in the Canadian Association for Zoos and Aquarium, which is basically the Canadian version of the AZA here, um, they were actually taking the land animals and butchering them and actually selling them through the park. So the deer and all the commercials and the deer, which, you know, if you were a kid, you went over and petted. Mm. Uh, when they were dead, they were actually sold for meat. So, yeah. Great times. Um, and another interesting too, thing, too, about the land animals is the land animals have no veterinary care. And because the park is privately owned and then the ownership of John Holler, he actually doesn't have to provide it. So. Specifically for the deer, John likes to drive around in his truck with his shotgun, which he keeps in his passenger side. Seen it. Um, he'll drive around and he'll actually shoot the deer, which are sick. Um, and that was one ex-employee, Jim Hammond. He came forward and he detailed the reason why he left. It was because John had went through, basically called the deer one night, and uh, he shot one deer and, and missed and hit it in the windpipe, and the deer was like flapping on the ground. You know. In, in really horrific pain for a long time. So he called John, he said, look, you have to come back here and you have to either shoot this animal or you have to call the vet to come and put this animal down. And John said, well, I just got home, so uh, there's a knife over in the shed if you want to go and finish, the, finish it up. So Jim actually talked in detail about this and how it took him minutes and how it was like cutting through concrete with a dull knife, um, basically to, to put this deer out of his misery. And that's, at that point, he, he walked away. So, December 21st comes, and Marineland basically has no response to that. How can you bear, like, when you have, when you're talking about imagery of mass graves, you know, mass dead animals, like all around that park, you're visiting basically an animal graveyard, right, when people go there. And that image is just not an image which is going to sell a theme park to kids, right? They don't have a veterinarian to come out and speak for them. They've got no one else. John is not someone you can put in front of cameras. So what do they do? They go to the shelf and they say, oh, let's take that suit that we were going to file against Dylan and let's announce that today. So what they actually did with the statement of claim that they filed against me for $1.5 million is they actually sent that to the press before they actually sent it and filed it in the court. Um, so it became their, their press strategy for how they were going to keep you know, marine land out of the press on this issue. But over that span of time, you know, if you're going to effectively organize against a slap suit, you basically have to illustrate or do one of two things. So if you can illustrate to the person who is suing you that you are actually using that suit as a way to broaden your support and broaden your reach and broaden your message, then why would they ever sue you? Because they fundamentally know that they're not actually going to win. They're not even attempting to win. They're just attempting to scare people and also to spend us into the ground. So if they can't do that and we actually broaden our reach and our support base, why would they ever sue? Or do you counter sue? Um, which is still an option in my case. And Christine Santos is the last trainer there to come forward detailing testimony. She's got a 1.25 million suit against her, and she just filed her counter suit. So um, hopefully, you know, between these combined strategies, we'll be able to effectively basically neutralize Marine Land using the legal system in this way. And um, funny enough, the day that uh, people probably, it's like, you know, why would you listen to Canadian news in Buffalo? But the day that uh, Premier Dalton McGuinty, who is uh, basically the Premier of Ontario, uh, what would be the similar governor, position? Governor. Governor, yeah, Governor. Uh, he basically steps down on October 16th, I want to say. And that was the same day which um, the Lawyers Association and uh, a whole bunch of civil rights groups in Canada put forward a bill to actually make slap suits impossible within our legal system. So this happens and then McGinty steps down, so therefore his par parliament is dead, therefore the bill is dead. Um, so we almost could have got lucky <laughs> if that would have um, sped through the process, but it's good to know that because when parliament is back that bill will get passed and it will be largely impossible for John Holler and for Marineland to use the legal system this way. So we're hoping this is the last time, <laughs> basically what I'm trying to say. But to go back to my point, what I was trying to make about coalition organizing, especially when it comes to 
legal support. This is something that was just fundamentally for me. Like, uh, I had been involved in radical organizing across different movements for a couple of years, and I understood that you know if your name gets called, uh, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, a lot of people give workshops on uh, you know internet security and uh, security culture and all these things, and they're very important, and people should listen to them. But at the end of the day, if your number's going to get called, your number's going to get called. There's very little you can do about that, and um, you know it's very arbitrary who the legal system and the state will actually look on to kind of put their oppression against, but so with this in mind and basically that being my perspective from the get-go, my goal was to create a network of as many people as I possibly could who were organizers across different movements, get involved, help them out, show them solidarity so that when the time comes and something comes against me either in civil court or you know it's criminal charges, that I actually have a broad base of support. And this is like that's the that's the network, the speaking network is set up, right? Um, when we go to town, town, it's friends which I've organized with. Um, a lot of them are outside of the animal rights and animal liberation uh, movement. Um, but again, they recognize that this is an issue that is broader in scope than that. So. That's why the Seattle protests worked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about Seattle less? <laughs> <laughs> Not again. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> But that's just fundamentally true, you know, what you say. Um, some of the largest kind of mass mobilizations against uh, power, domination, greed, corporate, uh, you know, corporate capitalism, all these things have been the protests that are coalition spaces where it's opened up and it's basically, you know, everyone come together because fundamentally this is like so simple. Organizing, uh, in my mind, effective organizing relies on very simple principles. It's not complex. You don't need a PhD to understand it, you know, and it really fundamentally runs along everyone's, uh, you know, own experiences, and that's, we're stronger. Together we're stronger, just, you know, fundamentally, whether it's in Western New York, you know, I know you guys are fighting against fracking, that's like a huge yeah. battle here. Yeah. Together you're stronger, so, you know, animal rights activists need to be involved in that because, you know, all the waterways, everything that's being depleted there environmentally that affects animals, environmentalists, um, people who have a critique of corporate control, you know, of our energy systems, get involved, make that a coalition space for people, and try and broaden that out, right? The Keystone. Yep, yeah. Keystone's another great example. That was actually a, a really cool thing that happened with us. Uh, some Keystone organizers not too long ago reached out after the suit was filed and was like, yeah, you know, the same thing's happening to us right now. We love Greenland and we we'll move out. So I'm like, I love Keystone. I'm like, hey, this is great. But that's basically, you know, where we're at to the, to the present. And, I wanted to bring that message in this space, particularly because you know, you know, it, it really challenged people. Whatever on these shelves, you know, whatever is your key issue, hit up a shelf that's a different issue. You know, read a book outside of what you feel like you know and you already organize around. Or if you're not, you don't organize, you're not active around these issues. You know, pick up a book that you really don't know very much about. Uh, I can tell a really funny story. Previous to me going um, vegan, and this is like the weirdest text to really be influenced by. Um, but I used to go through the library at Brock University and I used to just kind of hang out up in the top levels and just kind of pick books off the shelf like that. And I picked Derek Jensen's Endgame off the shelf one time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was before I got involved in organizing, before I was an activist or anything like that. And I read that book and, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, deep ecology and uh, a lot of what Derek said really made sense. But when he was talking about eating animals and animals wanting to be eaten, it was just not an argument that I could really get behind. <laughs> So it really forced me to think, like, you know, are there really consenting parties in this? And if they're not, then why do I do it? It's like, oh, well, I do it out of pleasure. It's like, well, that's really messed up. I wish someone would have told me that earlier, right? Um, but that's basically how you got to think around these issues, though, to me. What ends up happening a lot, especially when you're talking about animal rights activism, is it, a lot of times, or even, you know, different movements, it becomes about illustrating how deep your conviction is on that issue. As if that is what's going to win. You know, if we can just illustrate to the public that we, you know, we feel this so strongly, and this is our conviction that you know it's going to it's going to persuade the public and the community, and everyone's going to come on board. We know that's not true. Fundamentally, we know that's not true. Anyone who's involved in organizing, you look at the history of these social justice movements. You know, it's just not going to happen, right? Uh, you can fly your flag as high as you want. You can yell as loud as you want, but you know, unless you're making those connections and you're organizing in those ways. Um, and making those coalition spaces, you're not going to bring other people on board, and you're actually going to weaken what you're doing, right? 
So this is what I ended on when I gave that talk way back in October, and a bunch of people got mad because this was an animal rights fundraiser, and I talked about um, migrant justice advocacy and sanctuary cities and all these things because it was an event that was called Animals Beyond Borders. Yeah, so I was like, how are you not going to talk about those things, right? Borders is a, a human construction, you know, play a large role in how we treat other animal species, but they also play a huge role in how we treat each other and how we look at each other, right? Um, the land that we exist on, genocide happened on this land. There's no other way to, to talk about it in, in those words, right? But, if we're going to be successful, it's going to be because we we're able to con continue on with the process that led us to the first movement or you know, the first issue that we really responded to or we really got involved with. And what I mean by that is, you know, for someone to look at the animals at marine land and see a living sentient being that actually has their own wants, their own needs, their own desires, right? That takes transformation because society in, at large is going to tell you that the dumb animals or they're there for you to see, right? So you either, generally I say it's one or two things, Either you have to think so critically beyond the social norm, or you have to um, feel so much. It has to be on a, a visceral, kind of emotional level where you're not thinking. You know, that transformation is going to happen. Um, that's why kids, kids, that second level is where kids really hit it. They, you know, there's this unthinking, emotional response that kids have when they go and see, you know, Kiska, who's the lone orca now at Marineland, in a tank. And it just, it's just sadness. Like, you know, these kids who are, it's like, yeah, you, they don't read these books, you know. Uh, and they don't really think these like really critical ideas, but they look in there and they're just like touched to a level where it's like, I, I don't even get it, right? But basically, if we're gonna be successful, it's how quickly and then also, you know, how far we repeat those processes over and over again. You know, are you able to transform yourself to the point where you understand power in that way? And the fact that the same systems of power that are trying to get you to look at other animal species as completely unimportant or as there for you. The same systems of power that want you to look at other people in your community and look at them as junkies, right? Or as crazies, or retards, or whatever word you want to throw out, right? These people are illegals, right? We need to be able to transform our thinking to a point where we see that inherently, no, they're human beings. Those are members of my communities, those are my brothers and my sisters, right? So that's what I wanted to come with tonight. Um, Relay Animal Defense shirts are on the back table. Uh, MarinelandAnimalDefense.com is our website. If you use social media, we're on all social media. And what else can I say? Opening demonstration May 18th. Bring your passport. Lie at the border. Say you're going to the Toronto Science Museum. Uh, oh. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> for people specifically in Western New York too, um, if people are interested in getting involved in organizing against this issue, we're trying to broaden our scope. This is traditionally one of their largest advertising bases is Western New York. You guys hear those message co messages constantly, right? So in that same way, we need to be organizing awareness campaigns where they're pushing their most, you know, amount of money is for ad budget. So. We also have a global awareness week coming up on from March 9th to March 17th, where we're trying to organize events around this idea of the fact that you know, we're in Niagara Falls, but we can't really reach a lot of tourists before they get to the park, right? So we're trying to kind of broaden our scope that way. So um, reach out. And I can before Les starts clapping, um, this space fundamentally, just like to think of what can come out of a space like this. And to recognize that you know, you know, certain people uh, work here and dedicate a lot of time and effort to here, but this is a community space. You know, if you guys want to see talks like this, or you want to read these books, or have this literature around, or have a space even to organize in, you got to support this space. So everyone here today, if you if you live in this area, you're around here, you know, get the heck off Amazon and chapters and all these other things, uh, and get down here and actually get some literature that you can't buy online and uh, engage with some ideas and some people that you can't meet elsewhere. Thank you. And if anyone has questions, you can do that after, too.